In the last episode, we witnessed the final epic clash of the entire Sengoku period, as the forces of Tokugawa Ieyasu closed in upon Osaka Castle, where Sanada Yukimura would make his last desperate stand in defense of Toyotomi Hideyori and the remnants of the old regime. Unfortunately, Yukimura would fall, Hideyori would take his own life, and the castle would burn. With this, Japan's period of incessant war came to its inevitable end. Now, in this final episode, with peace well and truly established over the land, let us return to Tokugawa Ieyasu, the last of the three great unifiers who had brought Japan into the new era. Let us return to him at the end of his days to reflect upon his tremendous life and legacy. After the last shot had been fired, after the last blood had been spilled, after the last rebel had been executed, through the ashes of Osaka Castle, the Sengoku period was over. Tokugawa Ieyasu, the great and old samurai leader who had previously fought his way to his total domination of the country in the year 1600, had now, 15 years later, finished what he had originally started. After the Battle of Sekigahara in 1600, where he had swept aside all those who had sought to stand against him, Ieyasu had crushed the opposition who had loyally supported the Toyotomi regime in the wake of Toyotomi Hideyoshi's death, leaving only Hideyoshi's young son, Hideyori, as a surviving holdover of the previous ruling family. Ieyasu had gone on to claim the title of Shogun, Samurai military leader of all Japan in 1603, the first to do so in 30 years, after the final shogun of the Ashikaga shogunate, Ashikaga Yoshiaki, had been deposed by Oda Nobunaga, who had brought an end to the Muramachi Bakufu back in 1573. Ieyasu must have always known that the day may come when he would need to destroy the last Toyotomi heir for fear of the great power he could amass at the hands of those who still held hidden loyalties to the previous regime. Perhaps Ieyasu had been planning to eventually end the threat of Hideyori all along. Whatever the case, he finally received his chance to do so in 1614, 14 years after he had won control of the country. What would follow would end up coming to be the most massive conflict of the entire Sengoku period fueled by deep-rooted animosity that stemmed back decades, a fitting end for the Warring Age. Yet it would take until the summer of 1615 for Ieyasu's goal to be at last realized, with the death of Hideyori and the remaining prominent samurai who supported him. For now, there was well and truly no one left to oppose the Tokugawa shogunate. The samurai military government that had been established with Edo as its main power base was a resounding authority which could be felt across the land. But the same could have been said for the previous regimes as well. The difference, as we have already discussed in prior videos, was that Ieyasu had learned a great deal from those who had come before. He knew what he needed to do to ensure that his power, and the power of his family, was maintained for generations to come. To this extent, he had retired early, only serving about two years as the shogun before handing power over to his son Hidetara, allowing him to smoothly transfer power onto the next in line, while also keeping a strong grip over the government while in retirement, a feat which neither of his predecessors had been capable of achieving. He contented himself with the peace he had established, through the walls and the chains that bound the country up under the rule of his family, the mighty institutions that he had not only carried over from the previous regimes, but also expanded upon to ensure that the country would not fall back into chaos. And to this end, he went down quietly into the world he had forged, drifting into the last months of his life, 
As if having finally accomplished his goals, his time had come to an understandable conclusion. By the spring of the year 1616, signs were certainly showing that Ieyasu's age had finally caught up with him, as a great weariness began to take hold over his body. It was no secret that Ieyasu was likely dying, and to this end, the imperial court would even come to bestow upon him the title of Daijo Daijin, Chancellor of the Realm, a position that had formerly been held by both of his predecessors in that of Oda Nobunaga and Toyotomi Hideyoshi. However, now, the title appears to simply be a symbolic move, to honor Ieyasu's life and legacy, for titles would have likely meant nothing anymore to the retired shogun. His mind, however, must have lingered to dwell upon Japan's future. Whether or not at the time he had realized it, he had just endured Japan's greatest age of turmoil and evolution, a period that saw Japan change and adapt more than the country had ever done in centuries prior, and had become reforged by not only the deeds of Ieyasu himself and the great unifiers who had come before, but also the many more scores of countless figures who helped pave the way for the great societal change that now resulted in the Edo period. Perhaps he must have wondered how Japan would continue to change in the years to come. Perhaps he wondered how long his family would maintain their grip over the nation. Perhaps he wondered how the future generations of Tokugawa shoguns would fare atop the country. Although he and his son, the current shogun Tokugawa Hidetada, had both survived the Sengoku Jidai, what would the face of future shoguns be without living through an age of war? Each shogunate that Japan ever had had been established by a mighty leader. But over time, the reign of shoguns to come had always weakened. This fact must have caused Ieyasu some stress. Yet there was little more he could do with the time he had. Ieyasu had done his part. He had delivered to his family rule over the nation. It was now up to his sons, grandsons, and great-grandsons to ensure that his family continued to do so, and to do so well. Now, his son Hidetada is someone, of course, who Ieyasu had been displeased with in the past. Hidetada's failures and insubordination during the Sekigahara conflict had left a sour mark on their relationship. But regardless, Ieyasu had allowed the title of Shogun to still transfer to him. And from this, Hidetada had slowly rebuilt the trust that his father placed in him. Hidetada had faithfully served as a competent and collected leader throughout the duration of the sieges of Osaka. Unlike another son of Ieyasu, Matsudaira Tarateru whose disobedience we witnessed in the previous episode caused his exile. Ieyasu would never pardon him, as Tadateru's character had been called into question, and Ieyasu was leery of what mischief Tadateru may cause once he had passed. There was no real reason to have fear of any other major insurrection following his death. The Osaka campaigns had served to further solidify who was trustworthy, even among the Tozama Daimyo, who had once opposed Ieyasu at Sekigahara. Still, Ieyasu conferred with his son Hidetada about what actions should be taken following his passing, just to ensure a smooth transition and to quell any tension that may arise, if at all. To this end, he had ordered several loyal Daimyo to amass armies ready to pounce on any potential rebellion, but also he had discussed his wishes with Hidetada to force Daimyo to remain in Edo for a period of no less than three years following his passing, to ensure that they could not revolt even if they wanted to. Hidetada is believed to have countered this idea with another, saying that the Daimyo should be allowed to go home after around one year instead of three, but then to shortly after call them back. Any who did not return would easily be seen as treacherous. Ieyasu is thought to have been very pleased with this wise course of action from his son, and further showed how the relationship between the two had become close again after their previous falling out. Moving into his final days, Ieyasu's condition worsened. Although popular stories have said that he had become ill from a bout of bad food poisoning, in reality he was likely dying from either cancer of the stomach or perhaps even syphilis. Whatever the case, 
Here at the old age of 73, one cannot say he had not lived a long and full life and was at the end of his time. It is here many prominent daimyo made their way to visit him in Sunpu to give their final farewells, with one of the most significant figures to arrive being none other than Date Masamune. Ieyasu had always remained suspicious of the Lord of Sendai, a man who had been one of the last of the truly ambitious daimyo, a lord who in his younger years had been a hostile conqueror and warlord in the north. Yet Masamune had continually served Ieyasu faithfully over the years, aiding the Tokugawa during the Sekigahara conflict and later taking a heavy role during the sieges of Osaka. Their final meeting was cordial, as these two old veterans of the Warring Age engaged in quiet pleasantries. In the end, Ieyasu had nothing to fear of the One-Eyed Dragon. At least, not anymore. Before he passed, as customary, he would write his death poem. Whether one passes on or remains behind, it is all the same. That you can take no one with you is the only difference. Ah, how pleasant, two awakenings and one sleep, this dream of a fleeting world, the roseate hues of early dawn. On the seventeenth day of the fourth month of the old calendar, Tokugawa Ieyasu, the final of Japan's three great unifiers, died peacefully in Sunpu. By our modern calendar, the day of his death was June 1st, 1616. He would be buried at Mount Kuno, the present-day location of the famous Toshogu Shrine, which is of course dedicated to Ieyasu himself. There is so much that can be said about Tokugawa Ieyasu, his life and his legacy. Of all of the tremendous figures who fought their way through the chaos of the Sengoku period, it would be he who in the end would claim ultimate victory allowing him to establish a lasting peace over Japan as arguably the greatest shogun of all time, despite his extremely short tenure of holding the actual title. But his path had not been perfect. He had not experienced the meteoric rise or birth into greatness that so many of his Sengoku-era counterparts had achieved. Instead, Ieyasu's progress had been slow and had been met with many challenges. When we compare him to the other great names of the period, Oda Nobunaga, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, Takeda Shingen, Uesugi Kenshin, Morimoto Nari, and so many more, the comparisons are stark. Where each of those mighty leaders had exploded into Japanese history with a blazing fire that burned their name into legend, each of them seizing power in magnificent fashion and using their military prowess to achieve momentous victories that went on to further build upon their great accomplishments. Ieyasu had bided his time. Sure, he had taken action when he thought appropriate, but it did not always pay off. We need only look at his defeats at Mikatagahara and Komaki Nakakute, which although both of those conflicts still turned out favorably for the Tokugawa, are by no means great successes, and show the true nature of the great gambles that Ieyasu was willing to partake in. He would inevitably swallow his failures and shortcomings, and instead would align himself with those in stronger positions than him, be it Nobunaga or later Hideyoshi. This helps paint the context for the popular saying regarding the three great unifiers. If a bird won't sing, Nobunaga would order it to be killed, while Hideyoshi would rather course it to sing in some way. Yet Ieyasu, instead of taking any form of action, would simply decide to wait patiently for it to finally sing on its own. It is a useful way to compare the differences between these three great unifiers. In the end, that is just what Ieyasu would do, wait until Toyotomi Hideyoshi had died, all while cultivating his own power. Then risk everything in a series of political maneuvers that would result in the accomplishment of his ultimate aim, seizing his role atop the country. Each of the three great unifiers moved Japan further into a new and stable era of peace for the country, yet it was Ieyasu who finally and firmly capped it off where the other two had left room. And to this extent we can also compare the wider ambition present within the unifiers, as both Nobunaga and Hideyoshi had greater dreams of taking their conquests to foreign lands, 
They were not simply content with establishing a strong grip over Japan. Instead, they wanted to extend their control, building a mighty empire of their own. Ieyasu, on the other hand, was simply more focused on the security and well-being of the state. And this was probably the wisest course of action, ensuring a mighty rule at home with the longevity to rule for generations to come was something which Toyotomi Hideyoshi in particular was unable to guarantee, while Ieyasu on the other hand was capable of achieving. Why risk the stability of the state with foolish dreams of conquest abroad? Instead, Ieyasu cemented the Tokugawa name into history as the longest and mightiest samurai regime to rule Japan. A man born into the midst of the warring Sengoku period, who stood alongside its greatest leaders and warriors, who fought through many of its most significant battles, and who would in the end have the strength and wisdom to create an unprecedented age of peace and security. One largely set in motion by those who had come before, yet so skillfully guided into reality by a man with the ability to solidify this dream. With the death of Tokugawa Ieyasu, we see the death of the final great unifier, leaving behind the warring age of the Sengoku Jidai and moving onward and upward into the prosperous years of the long and relatively peaceful Edo period. So ends the story of the samurai great names who fought over power for roughly 150 years as Japan evolved into a new and stable nation. So, what can we learn in this last episode? On June 1st, 1616, roughly a year after the end of the summer siege of Osaka, which had brought an end to the Sengoku Jidai, Tokugawa Ieyasu, the final of the country's great unifiers, would die peacefully in the new era he had established. Leading up to his death, he had made sure that things would transfer smoothly, conferring with his son, the current shogun Tokugawa Hidetada, who reassured him that all would be well. He would also meet with one of the other final living warlords of the Sengoku period, in that of Date Masamune, who visited Ieyasu shortly before death. In the end, Ieyasu's passing would be the most peaceful of the three great unifiers, not only in the way he died, but also in the way he would leave the country, entering into a new bright age, freed from the chaos which had gripped the land throughout the previous era, as Japan had been remade under the mighty grip of the Edo Bakufu, the Tokugawa Shogunate. This is the end of the Sengoku Jidai series, which has taken 64 episodes to complete. In the coming weeks or months, I will create compilation videos to summarize not only the end of this chapter, but also the entire period itself. But don't worry, I am not fully moving away from the Sengoku Jidai, despite the fact that I also wish to move on to cover the Edo period. Rather, there is still plenty more to discuss in terms of the Sengoku period. More battles, sieges, and figures which I did not give a proper spotlight to, as well as a number of older episodes I would like to update. There is always more to come, but for now, I want to say thank you for being here until the very end. This is the series I set out to make when I originally started this channel, and finally now, we have concluded it. You have my eternal gratitude for following along all this time as we cover the story of this fascinating age of Japanese history. So, once again, thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.